The first time I saw the Skyfrost nail at the peak of Dragonspine, it took my breath away. Up until that point in the game, I hadn't seen anything that gave me such an overwhelming sense of mystery. The sense that I was treading on forbidden ground, discovering forbidden knowledge. N no, not that forbidden knowledge. I've been playing Genshin Impact since day one, and I'm constantly impressed by the depth of the lore and storytelling in a game that so many people write off as just another gotcha game. Today, I'm returning to the heart and soul of what hooked me and dragged me into the realm of digging for lore and theory crafting. It's like coming home. Today, let's talk about what we know for certain and then do a little speculative theorizing. Be warned that there will be very explicit spoilers regarding the most recent Archon quest in 3.2, as well as the Surumi Island quests from Inazuma and the quests in the Chasm. I'm Ganymede of the Hexen Zirkel, and I'll be your guide to the Celestial Nails. Dragonspine. The beginning is the best place to start. And to do that, I'll have to give you at least a basic rundown on the ancient civilization that once called Dragonspine home. There are tons of lore videos on Dragonspine and that civilization, Salvin Dagnir, out there, so I'm gonna try to keep it brief and cover the basics. Before the Archons we know were the gods of the land, there were civilizations older still. Dragonspine was once green and lush, and a great civilization was founded upon it by a group of people who sought to escape a land of eternal winter. This is likely in relation to the eternal winter imposed upon Mondstadt at the time by the wolf Boreas, though we can't really say for sure. It's interesting to note that while many texts mention this time period for Mondstadt, none speak of Salvandagnir by name, or even make any mention of a nearby advanced civilization. The civilization of Salvandagnir was, at the time, blessed by Celestia and considered themselves pious and devoted followers who looked to Celestia's messengers for guidance. At that time, it is said that heavenly envoys from Celestia visited the people of the world and advised them directly. When a new princess was born to their king, the proud nation believed its prosperity would last forever. However, shortly after, the heavenly envoys ceased their visits and the celestial nail descended onto the summit of Salvandagnir. With its coming, an endless blizzard descended on the once lush and green mountain that surpassed even the frozen tundra their forebearers had fled from. One day, the nail broke into three pieces for reasons unknown, one of the fragments falling upon and killing the Erminsul tree that grew from within the earth and sprouted atop the mountain. This caused a ley line disorder that made the climate change go from bad to worse. It was around this time that Emenlaka, a familiar name from Mondstadt's history and the founder of the clan of the same name, was an outlander in Salvandagnir. He was a close friend of the princess and her father, the high priest and king. With her blessing, he left on a long journey in a desperate attempt to find some way to reverse this calamity. During his journey, those who remained on the mountain and had not fled each enacted their own desperate attempts to save their homeland. The princess's father, Varric, perished in the sheer cold on his way up the perilous path to the peak where the Skyfrost Nail was located. He was making a last-ditch attempt to entreat the heavens to have mercy on them by approaching the summit where they had previously received heavenly envoys on many occasions. The kingdom's scribe, Uko, left behind his bitter account of the final days of their civilization and mentions what I presume to be the very founding of the nation of Conria. He seems to have been the last to perish, according to his account. I yearn for those frosty skies to stand in flames and burn till there's no living soul in the world. I yearn for us to turn to dust carried by the wind so that we can find that outsider who abandoned the princess. I yearn for the black dragon from the princess's dreams to engulf the land in a cloud of scarlet poison. For I am the last one. There's no need to keep watch any longer. I've heard of people who are building a new nation without gods. Perhaps they'll have the power to stand against this world. Their princess was gifted with the ability to receive visions of the future, and among those things she predicted was the fall of Durin on the mountainside many years after her civilization's end. She, like her father, succumbed to the cold while on her final mission, desperately trying to graft a branch of the leyline tree to try to revive the land. Eamon Laka would eventually return from his journey empty-handed, only to find that those who had sent him on his errand with hope had all perished. What would it be like, I wonder? 
to feel the encroaching despair and hopelessness as snow blanketed everything you knew and loved? What did the people of Salvin Dagner feel in their final moments? Would you feel regret like the princess who only wished she could have finished her final prophetic mural and found it to show signs of spring? Would you have felt the priest's despair as he lamented how he felt he had failed the children of his people and their future? Or would you have cursed the world and everything in it like the scribe? It's a question I hope no one ever has to find the answer to. The broken celestial nail would remain frozen, the domain known as the Peak of Vindagner sealed beneath it for millennia until the Traveler would arrive to repair the nail and reveal the secret beneath it. The Chasm While we had plenty of interaction with the strange, upside-down ruins in the chasm, we know far less about the civilization there. What we do know is that Daneslaif said that the structures were likely much older than Conria, and we can then deduce that they may have been part of the unified civilization that Enconomia's Before Sun and Moon text tells us about due to the nearly identical architecture. You can even find some of the same statues that litter Enconomia's temple complexes in some of the tunnels in the chasm, albeit in somewhat worse condition. The only thing missing from the assets are the little snake statues later attributed to Lord Orobashi. We see some of the same statues holding offering bowls, though broken and shattered in the main central area of the Upside Down Ruins, as well as in some of the side tunnels nearby. The Chasm Nail is more or less identical to how the Skyfrost Nail looks after the Traveler repairs it. It's got the same cracks and chips and likely uses the same in-game asset. The Chasm Nail has an effect swirling around it that seems to be made mostly of transparent glowing cubes. When you approach the space directly beneath it, which appears to have been shattered on impact, you can observe a subtle animation rising through the light coming from the cracks. It seems to most directly resemble the constellation animation that swirls around Paimon whenever you access the game's menus. Aside from this, we also have the limited event Perilous Trail, Though the event itself did not necessarily have much to do with the nail, what occurred could not have happened without the nail's presence, or so it's suggested. Zhao calls the place created beneath the nail chaotic, and it seems to have somehow broken both space and time. The space there already existed at the time of the Cataclysm when the missing Yaksha Bosatius was lost. The chasm itself has a long and nebulous history, going so far back as to be mentioned directly in accordance with the time of the Three Moon Sisters. This can at least be assumed, as at that time in Tevat's mythology, it is said that both the sun and moon were drawn across the sky by celestial chariots. While we know the moon was guided by the Three Moon Sisters who took turns driving their chariot, we know far less about the who or what that guided the sun. We do, however, know that at the time of the cataclysm that coincided with the death of the Moon Sisters, that the Sun's chariot literally crashed into the chasm. There are two accounts we have of this event, the in-game book series titled Records of Duyun, Hidden Jade, and the Solar Relic from the Vermilion Hereafter artifact set. In a past beyond memory, when even Rex Lapis would still have been young, a star fell from the sky into the barren plains west of Liyue. These plains were transformed into a huge and deep chasm in the wake of that star's descent, and Jade would emerge from within, beautiful and limitless, and it would become the foundation for a thousand years of industrial mining in Liyue thereafter. This seems to detail the very creation of the chasm, as it goes on to say, Later, when countless gods and rulers fought over the appointed celestial seats and the very stars and abyss themselves faded, tragedy and evil embarred the breath of the waters and mountains. The fallen star could bear this no longer, and heedless of the great chasm's persuasions to stay, it leaped away, away towards the heavens. As it returned to the skies, the heavenly jade left behind a deep pit, within which humans would build great cities and mighty fortresses finding refuge and shutting themselves in with the leftover inheritance of that fallen star. Over the tumult and storms of the next few thousand years, the readouts of the Dunyu Valley stood tall and maintained prosperous relations with Liwe Harbor up until about 500 years ago. But with the coming of the Black Calamity and the rise of the Abyss, 
The residents of Dunyu sealed the ancient city and departed for other lands. None know why these refugees chose to shut the gates of their home, and even the millennia-old Adepti and Yaksha are silent on the matter. And so, the sealed fortress became giant, silent tombs, with naught left in them but the sound of pond water and the wind rustling through empty halls. And thusly, too, did they come to be called the Dunyu Ruins by the people of Liyue. In Yellen's story quest, we find out that there are indeed ruins beneath the Dunyu Ruins, and that the Fatui have taken special interest in excavating them, though we never find out why or for what they were searching. The ruins appear to be of the typical shape and architecture found throughout Liyue, though, and are not the same assets used for the enigmatic Upside Down City and Ankonomia. However, I do not believe that this fact means that the two are unrelated. I think that the Upside Down City may have been the older part of the civilization's underground home, perhaps displaced by the star's initial impact. The other, contradicting story from the Solar Relic states that when the sun's chariot fell and created the chasm, the indigenous people already living there repaired it, allowing it to return to its perpetual western motion. The story itself, however, quickly casts doubt on this very tale by having a second voice come in and say, Hey, hey, that's a joke, right? I mean, you can't trust these baseless folktales, can you? I've seen a handful of theories around this, ranging from the idea that the sun or star was in fact Rex Lapis upon his descent from Celestia, to suggesting that the star was like the ones from the Unreconciled Stars event that had fallen to Earth. But if there's any thread of truth in the story of the indigenous people repairing the fallen chariot, maybe the answer is to direct ourselves back to Dragonspine and another celestial object that we, ourselves, repaired as the Traveler. Maybe the story was about the chasm's celestial nail all along, but only Hoyoverse really knows the answer to that question for sure. Inazuma But wait, you say. There's no celestial nail in Inazuma. Well, I believe there is. We're just not shown it directly with our eyes through exploration. I know that I was beyond disappointed to find that at the bottom of that suspiciously perfect hole beneath Amekumo Peak, there was not, in fact, another nail waiting for me to discover. Even the atmospheric conditions of Amekumo Peak looked like that of Dragonspine, and I was so, so sure we were going to find another there. Before the area released, I stood there at the border, staring at the ominous whirlwind, the similar atmospheric effects, and I was so sure of what was waiting for me there. Though there's no nail that we can physically see, there must be one somewhere perhaps buried, lost to time, sunk into the ocean. Obviously, this crosses over into theory territory, but I do think there is more than enough canon evidence to prove that a celestial nail dropped on Inazuma. There is, as I said before, something that appears in close proximity to a celestial nail, and only in close proximity to a celestial nail, at least that we know thus far. An Erminsel Sprout. The very first of these is located at the grave of the fallen princess of Salvandagnir. The second is in a side tunnel in the chasm, not all that far from the chasm's nail at all, comparatively. And though Inazuma is visibly so far entirely nailless, and I've got nothing to show for all of my Amekumo peak pining, an identical Erminsel sprout can be found on the shore of the lost island of Fog, Tsurumi. Tsurumi Island is also of great importance and linked to these other ancient civilizations due to the presence of almost identical murals littering the subterranean depths of its ruins. The iconography and style are perfect matches for the ones in Dragonspine, and even bear some similarities to the ones found in the many pyramids and tunnels of King Deshret's fallen empire in the desert of Sumeru. While there is no physical proof of the presence of a celestial nail, I genuinely think that through deduction and even by the quest dialogue, we can assume that there is one somewhere, lost beneath the silt and sand of the island. During the quest, the Sun Wheel in Mount Kana, the Traveler interacts with statues using the Thunderbird's feather. One such interaction gives this dialogue in response. Emotions come forth. Once, strange objects fell from the heavens, one of which landed upon this island after which your sky returned to its clear state. 
Afterward, the fog started to emerge. Though you had the power to disperse that fog, it meant little to you either way. Afterwards, those furless human beings began to gather the feathers that you shed at fixed intervals. Most puzzling behavior indeed. The quest giver herself, Sumida, also says, According to your plot, the flow of time in Surumi Island does not match that of the outside world. If it were me, I certainly would, as you have, ascribe this to a special leyline disorder. I doubt that such a leyline disorder could occur naturally, so... Let's just say it fell from the skies. Maybe it was a fragment of Celestia or something, which then mixed together with the lightning storms created by the Thunderbird to create these phenomena. And I'd give this plot a 4 out of 10, maybe. It's usable, but it's hard to execute. There should be a more elegant way of writing this. This strongly suggests that a nail did in fact fall upon Surumi Island, causing the same strange leyline disorders that the other nails seem to have affected. Also of interest is the exact location that the Erminsel Sprout can be found on Surumi Island. After completing all of the related quests to the storyline, the fog dissipates from the island, but the island changes further and there are now ghosts scattered throughout its plains and valleys, some of which you can interact with and do quests for. The Erminsel Sprout is directly beside the ghostly NPC known as the Boatman. When you interact with him, he will give you hints about other ghosts scattered about who he wants you to guide to him, so he can then have them board his boat and guide them to the afterlife. When you look at Boatman, you see a transparent blob vaguely shaped like a person, but to the other NPCs, he appears as a man dressed in gold with a splendid silver boat. Now, thanks to what we've learned in Sumeru about Erminsel and the afterlife, perhaps that Erminsel sprout itself is the silver boat mentioned here. When someone passes on, they return to the cycle. This is, of course, the very core of our dear Dendro Archon Nahida's story arc. All souls and their memories are recorded in Erminsul, and the Tsurumi Island quests give us a hint of this through Kama, Sumida's helper, who is identical to the man of the same name that lived many, many years ago, at the time of Tsurumi Island's final ill-fated ritual. This confirms that for Tivat, Erminsul is responsible for at least part of the world's literal cycle of death and rebirth. Sumeru The events in Sumeru are still unfolding, and by the release of 3.4, I have a feeling we're going to get to the truth beneath the mystery of that whirlwind in the northern part of the desert. And maybe we'll see if my theory holds more water then. Until that time, Sumeru has actually given us an important source regarding the celestial nails that corroborates Kana the Thunderbird's account. While we can't be certain it occurred at the exact same time, it does seem to describe the same kind of event. This is an account of King Deshret from the Staff of Scarlet Sands. First, the sun and the moons were created, and thus day and night came to be. She once described the night sky adorned with three bright moons to me in a language I have now forgotten. Yes, the number of moons should be three. May the shadows of the world cast their pearly shimmer upon the earth when they awake, such that people can follow the silver-plated outline of the dunes at night to find their final fate. Next, wheat was created. Thus, sand sank, forming the earth, and that which was without weight became the sky. I stipulated that one should rely on the earth, but dream of the sky. The weight should not be excessive or the land will bind people's feet, impede those longing to travel far, and hinder expansion through exploration while causing people to be unable to fly high, unable to explore the future. Then, the seven sage monks were established again, and they ruled the trajectories drawn by the earth, water, and stars. Even if the celestial sphere was just an illusion, myths are often born when people look up at the stars and the moons. In the original world, the barriers were torn down and the dark poison had penetrated the earth. To heal that fragile, sad, and imperfect world, the spikes descended and pierced through the Earth's crust. However, the rules I have set are more elegant and precise, so there is no need and there should be no followers of hers who shall die meaninglessly on their account, and no poetry should be lost for their sake. Next, the beastly trail from the poison should be cut off, for taking poison is a sin running deeper than the sky, but how sweet the whispers can be and how clear the wisdom of which they speak. The wind arises in the new world, the pearly moonlight, the amber afterglow, 
the waves of grass and the roots of the waters have gradually ceased to be silent, all singing the poems that she left behind. The cycle of seven must be removed because the secret narrative will be blocked. Fear and grief must be torn down, and so the barrier between life and death must be removed. Remove the suns, the moons, and wait, for there should be no barriers between time and space. Remove the original principles of rules, verdicts, and grace, so that she will no longer be afraid of the punishment that is laid on her kin. Remove birds, beasts, fish, dragons, humans, and even the seven monk kings so that none shall steal wisdom. The Sand King sleeps alone in secret dreams, drawing up new theorems. None shall have to drink salt water in the king's realm, for everything in the new world shall be good. This is how perfection can be achieved. I can see the three of us debating in our paradise once more. We are so close. Yes, this is splendid. I understand now. This is what I have always wanted. That which I have always longed to find once more has never been a paradise for the many. All the parodies of the teachings and the seven wise monks are the so-called pure world, free of all sorrows. None of those things matter anymore. But I do not wish that the poison ingested by mistake should remain in this world. Perhaps she might, in light of our friendship. Even she will do it for my sake. That is also fine. I only ask that she do me one last favor for the sake of our mutual friend. Okay, that's a lot. First, Deshret talks of someone who told him the truth of the ancient past, that there were three moons once, and that weight, maybe more specifically gravity, was the first law of the world that was created and put into place. He mentions the seven sage monks being established again, perhaps a reference to what the Book of the Sun and Moon of Enconomia told us, that there have always been seven sovereigns, even from before the world of Tevat was technically created by the Primordial One. When the Primordial One birthed the world of Tevat and created mankind, seven dragon or bishop lords already ruled the chaotic darkness as sovereigns. So at this point, we have to ask if Deshret is talking about the Archon War or the original seven. In the original world, the barriers were torn down and the dark poison had penetrated the earth. To heal that fragile, sad, and imperfect world, the spikes descended and pierced through the Earth's crust. Here we have a reference to that first world where barriers were torn down and dark poison penetrated the Earth. We have precedent for this as well, possibly, literally, by the dark mud in the chasm. At one point in the chasm's story quest, we find the adventurer Shi Shong having come into contact with the dark mud and rambling about things she couldn't possibly have known related to the calamity in Conria. Now I bring you back to Nahida and her final conversation with Lord Ruka Devada, where Ruka Devada said that she was polluted from the beginning, and therefore the only way to completely purge Erminsul of this blight is to purge her from its records entirely. But if she, the living avatar of Erminsul, was always polluted, doesn't that mean that Erminsul itself from the very beginning was polluted and there is no end to the cycle of forbidden knowledge cropping up and needing to be exercised? definitely a thought to consider. It seems to me that the forbidden knowledge, which seems to actually contain the very truth of the world of Tevat, repeatedly resurfaces and then is repeatedly purged by Celestia. Just as any normal ley line flow can cause us to be able to interact with the normal memories of the ley lines like in Deluxe's recent event, it seems that Erminsul also ends up recording the memory of this forbidden knowledge whenever it comes rising up from the abyss. The celestial nails we have seen in game so far don't seem to have any obvious purifying qualities. Rather, the idea of purification seems to be that the nails are weapons used to scour the people who have strayed too close to these forbidden things from the face of the earth. Maybe that's the only way to stop an outbreak of this dark mud once it has begun. While theorizing on what forbidden knowledge is and what causes it could be another entire video all on its own. We can now see that the dark mud and the knowledge it carries is so deeply connected to the celestial nails that we can't really separate the two. While King Deshret called the nails spikes of purification, I can't help but feel that there is a certain ominousness to it all. If Celestia's only recourse is to resort to genocide whenever the forbidden knowledge appears, almost definitely now synonymous with the chasm's dark mud, is it really purification or something else? From where we stand in the story, I simply cannot imagine Celestia and whoever might be in charge as the big god on top can be considered the good guys. Hashtag Kunria did nothing wrong. And looking at the new model of Celestia, I wonder, are those nails locked and loaded and ready to fire? 
and since it seems to be hovering almost directly above Fontaine, which our buddy Liban seems to have some really ominous news about, well, uh, let's hope it really has fallen silent. 500 years is a long time. Maybe it's uninhabited. Maybe there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> uh. With the evidence I've presented, I'll leave it to all of you to decide. For now, this is Ganymede of the Hexen Circle, signing off. I hope you'll join us on our next adventure. <laughs> <laughs>